I love to see when the youth come to these kind of things because they're the generation that's going to save the country. And they, they need to hear these stories. Now, some people think uh, these stories are quaint. They don't relate to, to our times today. Uh, but um, as soon as we get, um, we're going to get to a certain point here, and I'm going to show you live. I was there. I recorded this when Washington was there. Um, I'm going to show you what happened, and then I'm going to discuss it with you, how uh, Washington should have been. <clears throat> this uh, lesson, by the way, is Washington Creates America. Next week is called The Father of the Constitution, uh, which is about Madison. We, we have thrown Madison under the bus, and we've ridden the bus backwards and forwards. Uh, very few people know what Madison really was saying. So we're going to have a whole lesson dedicated to him. Um, the, the week after that will be the first seven presidents, what they thought of the Constitution, particularly Andrew Jackson and Thomas Jefferson. And then the last week, which will be May 21st, um, we're going to have a lesson called Restoring America. It may take two and a half to three hours. And I'm going to lay out the things that need to be done to restore America. And then it's up to people to, to decide how they want to handle things. But tonight, um, do we have any questions on anything that was discussed in previous lessons? We have different people here every week. Uh, but uh, is there anything anybody wants to ask about anything that's been discussed previously? If not, I want to mention something right up top that I should have mentioned last week. Um, how are we doing, Tom? Almost 24. Okay. Um, the founding fathers of this country there wasn't just six of them, there was about 250 of them, uh, <clears throat> are not understood today. And one of the reasons that we don't embrace what they said is because we don't know what they said. That's one of the big problems. We don't understand the success formula that they cobbled out. And. Um, I want to tell you something about the Bible. The founders took a look at the Bible. Not only in 1782 was the first Bible adopted for the United States of America by the United States Congress. And that Bible, in Isaiah 33:22, says that we need three branches of government. How do you like that? Isaiah talked about lawgivers, judges, and kings. That's three branches of government. That's Isaiah 33, 22. If you go to Jeremiah 17, 9, man has a deceitful heart, so we've got to have separation of powers because we can't have one person in charge of everything. And then... Um, <clears throat> In the book of Revelations, which is a very important book to read, particularly in the times we live in, the seventh chapter and ninth verse, all people are created equal, no matter their race, origin, or creed, and John the Revelator talks about that. But something very, very important happened when um, the great prophet of the Old Testament, his name is Moses, went up to Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments. They were written by the finger of God, and God wrote down two different times, private property is sacred. Private property is sacred. How did he say that? Covet. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's property, thy neighbor's wife, manservant, maidservant. Okay, that's property. What else did he say? There's another one. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not steal. Or kill or whatever. That's a felony. You can't steal. you got to respect private property. We're getting all over the country now. We're not respecting it. But um, 
Good. Uh, I want to tell you something. A lot of people today are, are a little bit cynical about the country, about the uh, direction of the country and, and what the country stands for. They need to do their homework because the Founding Fathers put together a success formula. And to understand that success formula, we have to make, become acquainted with what they actually did and what they did and what it means. Um, we would have no country except for one man. One man. And that man was here at that very moment. See this? I got a lot of pictures of him. This is a great man here. Now, the country um, has Lincolnitis. Now, Lincolnitis is not a bad thing. Because Abe Lincoln was just great. I've taught about Abe Lincoln on many occasions. He was a great man for a great time. But I've got to tell you something. We don't talk about this man, and without this man, we have no Lincoln. We have no country. This is the indispensable man right here. And we're not, no, we don't know enough about him. We've kind of forgotten. But um, I'm going to start this off. This was a man called of Almighty God to do something. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And I'm going to show you that tonight. And I'm going to show you what he did. Now, Tom, if you can turn up the... Um, the volume, just a minute. I'm going to give you a precedent to what you're going to see here. I don't always agree with the History Channel, but <laughs> I, I want to use it in this case. There was a battle in 1755 in Monongahela, Pennsylvania. Uh, how old was Washington in 1755? No. 23. 23. 23. That's, that's fine. He's 23 years old. And he was uh, an officer with the British. And they were going out to claim some land in the western part of Pennsylvania. And lo and behold, they got caught in ambush. And uh, there was a tremendous massacre that occurred. And I want Tom to play this, uh, and I'll show you, show you what happened, and then I'll embellish what happened, and maybe we'll get the lights. Go ahead, Tom. They are near the Monongahela River, less than 10 miles from Fort Duquesne. slams into Braddock's men from three directions. The enemy is everywhere and nowhere. Indians are charging from all directions. There's powder smoke everywhere. Nobody can get their bearings. Where are the front lines? Where are the flanks? And the wounded are screaming. The British regulars collapse completely. Washington keeps his cool in the midst of a tremendously chaotic situation. As General Braddock falls, mortally wounded, only one man steps into the breach. Washington directs Braddock's officers who have no idea what to do. He tells them to pull Braddock out and where to send his wagon and where to withdraw. And Washington is put in command by default of a whole regular British force. In this action, we can see something that later on we're going to see he's very good at, which is sort of a calm presence, a, a galvanizing presence, and an ability to bring order to a chaotic situation. 
Washington, the general's aide, is now in command, a prime target. Enemy soldiers take aim. A bullet tears through Washington's coat, close enough to kill. In rapid succession, more musket balls rip his clothes. Amidst the carnage, Washington manages to organize a retreat. Dead and wounded are everywhere. By any measure, Washington should have been one of them. And it's a story that people will keep tallying for the next 20 years. Uh, and even later on, when he's appointed commander-in-chief, they say, oh, it's the hero of the Monongahela. A Virginia minister proclaimed that Washington's survival seemed the work of providence. For the first time, Washington had been revered as someone destiny had chosen for greater things. And in truth, just looking at it, you almost have to believe it. Because to have survived that battle without even being scratched while so many others were, went down is, uh, is a bit of a miracle. The bloody destruction of Braddock's army left the Virginia frontier easy prey for Indian raiders. Governor Dinwiddie revived the Virginia regiment and asked Washington to assume command of the rank of colonel. Can we get the lights? Please. All right. This isn't ex exactly what happened, but it's close to what happened. First of all, uh, Ellis, who's a historian, a very famous historian, Joseph Ellis, said it's a bit of a miracle. It's a downright miracle. Washington should have been massacred. And I'm going to, I'm going to read you something, an Indian prophecy. That's exactly right. An Indian prophecy that you probably never have heard of yet in the schools. Turn, turn that on, too. An Indian prophecy that none of you young people probably heard. you got a lot of young people here. I want you to listen closely to this prophecy that I'm going to tell you. But in, in this film that we saw, um, not only was Washington's cloak shot at, at point-blank range, uh, four or five different times. He never, the bullet never hit him. His hat <clears throat> was shot off. His boot was shot off twice. He put it back on, it was shot off again. He had two horses shot from under him. All of these men are strewn out, murdered by the Indians. He got out of there, and some of the men got out, too. No question he should have been killed. But I want to read you something that happened 15 years later. There was an Indian chief that um, was there and had his musket at point-blank range to Washington. About as close as me to you, Dave. And he was shooting, and he couldn't hit him. He couldn't hit him. And finally, 15 years later, Washington went over to the western states. He had his doctor with him. Dr. Craig was with him. Dr. Craig wrote this experience in his diary. That's how we have it. And. Um, <clears throat> Uh, they were invited by this Indian chief and a group of Indians to come and uh, sup with them. Washington went and the Indian chief started to talk because he was there at the Battle of Monongahela. And he says, I am a chief and the ruler over many tribes. My influence extends to the waters of the Great Lakes and to the far blue mountains. I have traveled a long and weary path that I might see the young warrior of the great battle, that battle 15 years ago, the Battle of Monongahela. It was on the day when the white man's blood mixed with the streams of our forest that I first beheld this chief. I called to my young men and said, Mark yon tall and daring warrior. He is not of the Redcoat tribe, he hath an Indian's wisdom, and his warriors fight as we do. Himself is alone exposed. Quick, let your aim be certain, and he dies. Our rifles were leveled. Rifles which but for him knew not how to miss. 
Twas all in vain, a power mightier far than we shielded him from harm. He cannot die in battle. I am old and soon shall be gathered to the great council fire of my fathers in the land of shades. But ere I go, there is something bids me speak in the voice of prophecy. Listen, and then here's this great Indian chief in 1770 prophesying. He prophesied about Washington. And here's what he said. Now, you young people, this is the only time you're ever going to hear this, unfortunately. So listen closely. Because here's a prophecy uh, about the future of George Washington's life. The great spirit protects that man and guides his destinies. This is 1770. He will become the chief of nations and a people yet un a people yet unborn will hail him as the founder of a mighty empire. And that's what happened. And during the Revolutionary War, do you have the uh, this, we've got to convert to that. And the Revolutionary War. During the Revolutionary War, how many times was Washington shot? A million times. I know that. Yeah, how many times was he shot and wounded? None. None. How many times, how, how long of a period did he go back to Mount Vernon from the front of the Revolutionary War? Now, the Revolutionary War was how many years? Eight, eight years. So how many, how many, uh, how much time did he spend at Mount Vernon in the eight years? One week. Rest of the time he was with his men, either at Valley Forge or Morristown, which was worse than Valley Forge, but we don't hear much about that. We hear Valley Forge all the time, but Morristown was worse. Um, he was among them. He was with them. He, um, we're going to hear about Trenton and Princeton tonight a little bit. We're going to have to hear about those stories because without Trenton, we're not here. Hey. Is that the right menu? Uh, I don't know how often. No, I don't think so. It's, it's on the Revolutionary War. Revolutionary War, we need the PowerPoint. Um, what, what, was I, what was I saying? I About Trenton. Head. Okay. Without Trenton, uh, we're not here. And that story of Trenton, you have to know. All you young people need to know it. You know why? Because you're the ones we're depending on. You're the next Trenton. We're going to have to have patriots like you to lead this country out of the direction it's going in right now. A lot of people uh, make the inference that uh, Washington was not they're, they're not, they're questioning what kind of a religious man he really was. And the idea is that uh, he really was a deist. He kind of believed that there was something out there, uh, but he really wasn't a church-going person, and he really didn't, uh, that's it, that's right. You know, look, have you read this? It's called Sacred Fire. It's about 1,200 pages. And even more in the back with all the footnotes. Because, see, you saw when General Braddock was killed, didn't you? And Washington took over, and Nong Healer. Guess who gave the eulogy at that funeral? Guess who gave the eulogy? Washington. You know what he said at that eulogy? He said, um, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. That's Washington. That's what he read. That's what he talked about. Uh, Washington was a very religious man. 
And some of you probably have um, pictures at home of Washington praying for help. Um, I want to read you what some of the um, some of the great authors say about Washington. Now, this is a this is a book I recommend. It's called *The Indispensable Man* by James Flexner. It's a very good book, and um, he makes an observation in the beginning of this book. Most of the brickbats now being thrown at Washington are figments of the modern imagination. In being ourselves untrue to the highest teaching of the American tradition, we of this generation have tended to denigrate that tradition. We're denigrating our own tradition. We've taken enough uh, cyanide in the last three generations to commit suicide. We're, we're denigrating the founding fathers constantly. But we're not sure what they said, but we just know what they said wasn't very good, and plus they were hypocrites. And they were landowners and they were property owners. All of these things are coming out. Um, to seek out all that was unworthy, that's not what you do in it, what we need to do in our history. Let's look at the good things. Tell the story, but look at the good things. Bring up the, the things that are really good in our history, because there's a lot of it to seek out all that was unworthy, to emphasize whatever justifies national distrust. In so doing, we have discarded an invaluable heritage. That's Flexner. We don't want to do that. King George III issued the proclamation in 1763. No better settlement beyond the Appalachians. All right, let's have number nine. It's not coming up. It's taking time for the thing to come up. Let me go into this, a couple of stories. Well, they work. They, <laughs> it doesn't usually happen, but I think that uh, more than anything else, my patience is being tested, so don't worry about it. Um, the American cause was over in New York because um, down in the Continental Congress, in 1776, uh, they chose George Washington to lead all the troops. And who nominated Washington? Keep it right there. John Adams nominated him in a, in a thrilling speech. Um, Washington just knew that he had to perform a duty, but he didn't know what he was getting himself in for. By the time he got up to Massachusetts, he looked at what he had and he said, is this what God has given me to, to fight for this country? It was, it was appalling what he had to work with. Well, uh, we should never have won the Revolutionary War. Uh, that should not have been done because the Continental Congress wound up sending Washington to New York. He said, you've got to go to New York because the British are coming into New York. How many ships did the British have that, that came into New York Harbor? And Washington went up there with his men. 400 ships. How many did we have? We had a little rubber ducky. That was it. 400 ships came in and, yeah. Yeah, that, that's true. That's true. You had 32,000 redcoats come in, and the Americans were scared. And they really were in retreat. Well, one battle led to another. They didn't do very well. <clears throat> Finally, they, they got cornered. Um, and it looked like all was lost. It was in August 
1776. And um, nightfall came, and they devised a plan to get all the Americans out at 9,000 at that time. Get them all out and, and retreat and get them on the, the skiffs, the little boats, and then they could go down and get, it, get out of the way of the British. And they were doing that, and as they were doing it, the British were on the way the next morning, and they were in sight of the Americans. And the Americans were up against the water. Well, all of a sudden, a fog came up. The fog was almost an impenetrable fog, and nobody could see in front of them, three feet in front of them. And in the meantime, they're loading these Americans on these boats and loading them in to getting them out. And Washington has really uh, got a, a furious job ahead of him. And he's getting mad at a couple of the officers that are, that are not doing what they're supposed to do. Mifflin is one of them, General Mifflin. And um, finally, he says to the officers, I'm going to be the last man out. And sure enough, the fog lifted. The British are coming. They're ready to take the last Americans. And who's the last person on the, on the 9,000? Washington's the last one on the ship, and they get out. And that saved the revolution for that moment. Well, they went all the way down across the Delaware, on, right here. I don't know if you can all see this. There's the Delaware. Here's Trenton, and they're over here. Washington's got 2,500 left. And um, it looks like the revolution's over. And he's, he's, he's got this little kind of an office that he's got. And he gets a, a visit from um, a physician, one of the first physicians in America. And his name was? Benjamin Rush, signer of the Declaration of Independence. Benjamin Rush comes in, and he talks to him, and Washington's talked to him, and, and, and Washington says to Benjamin Rush, I want you to thank your wife for sending that fish, that salted fish. Because I, I love salted fish. I really appreciate that. Now, this is a moment in time where death is in the air. And so Washington graciously tells him, Th thank your wife, thank Mrs. Rush for me. He walks out. Benjamin Rush happens to look down, and he sees under Washington's table a little note, and he goes and picks the note up. And he reads the note, and it says, victory or death. Victory or death. They, they come up with a plan that they would cross the Delaware and try to take the Hessians in Trenton. Hessians were mercenaries hired by the British. They said, this is, the, this is, this is it. The whole revolution rests on this. And it's in the wintertime, and the, the British normally didn't fight in the winter. They didn't believe in fighting in the winter. They waited for the spring. They thought the Americans were just a ragtag bunch of, of nothings that weren't going to win. Well, Washington got his troops out, and it was very cold. Uh, as a matter of fact, it started to sleep, and then it hailed, and then it snowed, and the temperatures went way down. And Washington went out to his troops, and he uh, said, I want to read you something. Uh, one of the people that's here has written something, and I want to read it to you so that you get the flavor of what we have to do. And then he takes this out of his pocket, and he said, these are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot shall in this crisis shrink from the service of their country. But he that stands it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. And that man was, Thomas who wrote Bates. that? 
Paine. That was Thomas Paine, who came over from England and he was right there fighting for the Americans in the revolution because he hated King George. Um, well, that stirred them. And they took, a, they took that skiff across the Delaware and they had to be very quiet. Washington thought they'd get there before daybreak. They never did get there before daybreak. And they crossed, they didn't even know if they could cross the Delaware. There was ice all over the place. They, they thought the whole thing was going to ice up and the, the, the whole plan would be, would be dashed. But there were chunks of ice and they were able to get through. And they had horses on these little skiffs, they had cannons. And they get through and, the, and it, it's 12 o'clock at night. And um, it's, it took them eight hours to get to Trenton. And on the way to Trenton, here's what Washington, um, it looks like uh, Prince Valiant, but he actually had this white horse, big white horse, and he was on this white horse on the way to Trenton. And guess what happened? They got to a cliff. And uh, by the way, I recommend that you read this. If you want to read one volume on Washington, because there's, you got Flexner's written five, and then you got Southall Freeman's got 12 of them. But if you want one volume, Ron Chernow, this is, this is the real volume on Washington that'll give you the, it'll give you a real good perspective. Well, all of a sudden they get to this cliff and his troops, his troops would call him His Excellency. And they'd write in their diaries, His Excellency did this and His Excellency did that. Well, they got to a cliff and Washington was on this big white charger and the charger slips and it's going off the cliff. And you've got people writing in their diary, they just kind of, they just put their heads down. They just thought he was dead. He was going to go right down to the chasm. All the way down. And Washington took the mane of that horse and pulled it this way, and he took the tail and pulled it this way, and stopped that horse dead in its tracks. And the, the others are looking at, wow, what a horseman. And he, got, he was able to, to level and stabilize that horse, and then they, he got up and through the cliff. He could have died right there, but he didn't. They got into Trenton about 8 o'clock in the morning. And um, the Americans took him in about 45 minutes. And they killed Colonel Rawl, who was the head of the Hessians. Now, the night before, uh, the Hessians liked to drink and they liked to party a lot. And they weren't that worried about the Americans. And the night before, uh, they, were, they were having a party and somebody was knocking on the door of the party, I want to see Colonel Rawl. And the, a sentry comes to the door and says, you can't. He's inside and he's, he's enjoying himself, he's partying. He closes the door. Guy comes back, knocks on the door again. He says, I've got to see Colonel Raw. I've got to give him, I've got to tell him something. You can't see him. And the guy closes the door again. Well, this guy comes back a third and last time, knocks on the door. Guy comes, he said, I, I already told you, you can't see Colonel Raw. He says, would you please give him this note? Takes the note and closes the door. The next morning, with Colonel Raw dead on the ground, as they searched through Colonel Rawls' clothing, they pulled this note out. The Americans are coming. He never read it. He never read the note. Well, at Trenton, they won that battle, and um, Washington, the, the, the men, wanted to go home, their enlistments were up. Now everything hinged, you being here tonight hinges on this. Uh, we wouldn't be here if it hadn't been for this man. This is, 
this is a man beyond belief. And he happened to be here right at the moment that he needed to be. And so you had all, you only had 2,500 men and, and two of them died of frostbite on the way to Trenton. And um, they wanted to go home to their families. They didn't think they were happy they won Trenton, but they didn't think they could do it against the British. So Washington gets on his charger and says this, my brave fellows, you have done all I've asked you to do and more than could be reasonably expected, but your country is at stake. Your wives, your houses, and all that you hold dear. You have worn yourselves out with the fatigues and hardships, but we know not how to spare you. If you will consent to stay one month longer, you will render that service to the cause of liberty and to your country, which you probably can never do under any other circumstances. Then the drums rolled. The sergeant recalled that the soldiers felt the force of the appeal and began to talk among themselves. So they were lined up and they were saying, well, you know, what are we going to do? He can't leave now. Is it, you know, he just can't do it. We don't have any 7-Elevens around. We got to stay. One said, I will remain if you will. Another said, we cannot go home under such circumstances. A few men stepped forward, then several others, then many more, and their examples were followed by nearly all who were fit for duty in the regiment, amounting to about 200 volunteers. These were veterans who understood what they were being asked to do. They knew well what the cost might be. One of them remembered later that nearly half of the men who stepped forward would be killed in the fighting or dead of disease soon after. An officer asked, asked the general, asked General Washington, if the men should be enrolled. No, said Washington. Men who will volunteer in such a case as this need no enrollment to keep them to their duty. Only a few days before, Washington was infuriated with these men and ready to clap some of them in irons. You know, they, uh, if you deserted they, and they caught you, they shot, they'd shoot you or they'd hang you. This was, these were tough times. This is tough stuff. They, they didn't tolerate this kind of stuff. You're, you had independence on the line. This is your country now. Now he was leading them in another way. This gentleman in Virginia was learning to treat a brigade of New England Yankee farm boys and fishermen as men of honor who were entitled to equality of esteem. That attitude had already begun to spread throughout the army. In 1776, American officers addressed even their lowliest privates as gentlemen. No other army in the world operated on such a principle. Europeans were startled to observe it at work in America. Nicholas Cullen observed in 1771, all are called gentlemen and ladies. Here was a new idea of a gentleman, a moral condition. Never had this before. Rather than a social rank. It was also a new idea of honor, which was not defined by rank or status or gender, but by a principle of human dignity and decency. Well, Washington wound up paying them out of his own money that he had. He had a friend uh, by the name of Robert Morris. You know who he was? Who's Robert Morris? Robert Morris signed the Constitution, and he also signed the Declaration of Independence. He's the wealthiest man in America. And the Continental Congress wasn't giving Washington any money because they couldn't decide on how to tax. They were under the Articles of Confederation, which is very weak. Well, he wrote to Morris and says, we have no money. So Morris went to his next door neighbor's house with a shovel. And in his next door neighbor's yard 
was a whole fortune of gold and silver. They dug that up out of the ground and they sent it to Washington. Well, um, they had to fight the Battle of Princeton now. And lo and behold, the British were so upset, they had to get rid of their mistresses, and it was really, it was very difficult. Um, they, <laughs> they all of a sudden, they had to fight, and they had won Trenton, Washington went back, and they wanted to, they had an idea to go to Princeton. Well, Cornwallis is coming from Princeton. Cornwallis was very arrogant. Oh, he, he was breathtakingly arrogant. And so here comes Cornwallis, and they stop here at night, and they see all these embers burning. He said, we'll take them in the morning. So they went to take them in the morning, and they were gone, because Washington went up the left flank to Princeton, where Cornwallis just came from. So they went to Princeton, and the, the men weren't used to fighting, you know, they, they in combat with the British. And um, Washington saw that they were in retreat many times. And so he had his men, and of course the British would line up. They wouldn't fight like the Americans, they lined up in a line. And the Americans were really afraid. And Washington, on his white charger, went around the left flank and went in between the British and the Americans as fire, the muskets were going, and this, in those days the muskets go and the, all the smoke comes up, nobody can see anything. Well, one of his aide-de-camps writes in his diary, he put his head down and he knew Washington was dead. He, he said, this is, this is beyond belief, because he's leading the troops, he's showing them, you gotta, you gotta fight. So the, the, the smoke clears, and here's Washington over here on the left flank, untouched. Well, they took Princeton, and that saved the revolution. That saved it. And they had to bed down in the wintertime. That winter, I believe it was Marstown that winter. Uh, and they could have taken, they could have taken the British at Brunswick. They had all of their, their munitions and everything, all their stores. But they had been up for two nights. And they, all of his men were weary and all, he wrote in a letter, all it would take was 500 fresh troops we could have taken Brunswick. But they couldn't do it. He said, I couldn't, I couldn't leave them. The men were just uh, fatigued and just exhausted. So they spent the winter in freezing cold and many men died that winter. Well, now, what caused all of this? We still shouldn't have won this war. <clears throat> this war should have been lost. We shouldn't have the Constitution, we shouldn't have the Bill of Rights, and we shouldn't have won the War of 1812. Now you say, well, we didn't win the War of 1812. Well, we didn't lose it, because if we lost it, we wouldn't be here. See, my parents are from, uh, my uh, ancestors are from Russia, so I'd be somewhere in Siberia now. I'd probably be in a slave labor camp somewhere. But, <clears throat> but we didn't win the war. Well, we shouldn't have won it. All of these various things, that was the war that ended the, actually the Revolutionary War. Well, why were the Americans doing all this? What was the purpose of all of this? Because under British rule, they had it pretty good. You know, it was, a, it was a pretty good life they had. But the British had to pay for the war with the French, and they wanted to tax the Americans. And one of those taxes that you see on the board there was the Stamp Act of 1765. And there was a great man there who got up and made an impassioned speech. And nobody was quite sure who he was at the time. He wound up, he had 17 children. Um, King George had 15 children and went insane. Um, I, I, probably not from the children. but. Uh, but in 1765, this man named Patrick Henry got up and made an impassioned speech. How wrong it was. And how much was the stamp tax, by the way? One cent. One cent, and the Americans were outraged. 
We are now 150 to 180 trillion dollars in debt. We're not one penny in debt now. Any uh, average person of rational understanding would say this is too much. But the Americans, that one cent on that stamp tax, that, that's wrong because you're taking away our inalienable rights that Englishmen have. And we can't have that happen because we got to go back to the Magna Carta where we got that, those due process rights and all those inalienable rights. We got to have that. Well, what are you talking about? Well, you got to study your history. You, we got to have those rights because we got to be free. We want to be free. That's the most important. And if we're free, one thing we need is a free country to be citizens of. We can't be in, uh, in tyranny to somebody else. That's what they were fighting for. Liberty and freedom. So that you can have the freedom to, to, to transport things and to, to have interaction in commerce and to choose the school of your choice. Choose the person that you want to vote for. You have the, the freedom to vote. Uh, I think we're taking some things for granted. Well, they also had the writs of assistance. What was that? What's the writs of assistance? Anybody know? Help the soldiers, the British uh, soldiers. They did what? They're a quarter of the British soldiers? Well, they could do that, but the writs of assistance were a little different than that. Um, what were they? Anybody know? Well, the writs of assistance were when British would knock on your door, and they'd come into your house and said, uh, what, do you, what do you need? Well, we, were, we, we need to look under your bed here, and we're going to open your drawers, and we're going to look behind your curtains, and we're going into your bedroom and well, what are you looking for? Well, we don't know. We're just looking. A fishing expedition. There's writs of assistance. They could go in and just look. We don't have that here. We have protections against that. But that's what they were doing. That's a violation of your privacy. That's the writs of assistance. Well, let's see. You have the next slide, uh, Tom. Okay. Now, because of the Boston Tea Party, you have the Intolerable Acts. The British closed Boston to all shipping until the tea was paid for. Actually, the Boston Tea Party was a very um, peaceful operation. Who was the one leading that? Great man. We don't even we don't talk about him. I've looked at some of the books, and this man is not really talked about very much. It was who? Samuel Adams. Sam Adams. That's a great man. He was the father of the revolution. He talked about a revolution way before anybody else was talking about it. And he kind of led the Boston Tea Party. Let me, let me have the next slide. Okay, and General Gage was sent over uh, uh, by the, uh, by the, yeah, such a wonderful computer. Uh, <laughs> sent over by the next party. Next slide. And in 1774, I was telling you, I gave you a peek under what Washington was doing early on, but the, um, on my birthday, September 17th, it was very nice that they, they decided they weren't going to be, September 17th, 1774, they decided that they weren't going to uh, put up with the British anymore. Massachusetts decided that. We're not going to do anything with the British anymore. They also signed the Constitution on my birthday. That was very nice of them to do that. Um, I'm very, I, I thank them for it. It was very, very nice of them. Okay, now, Lexington Concord. We still don't know who made that first shot, but that's what started the whole battle. And what were the British going after? Guns. Guns. You're going, you get, see, if you want to beat somebody, get their guns. You get the guns, you win the war. That's why we got a Second Amendment, see? We have a Second Amendment in this country because we don't want them to get the guns. We want the guns because without the Second Amendment, the other parts of the Bill of Rights aren't very good. You've got to have that Second Amendment so that you can keep your First Amendment, your Third, Fourth, Fifth, Tenth, 
Tenth, we've thrown the Tenth Amendment out. What's the Tenth Amendment? States' rights, <clears throat> rights back to the states. Back to the states. We, we've really thrown that out. We've forgotten that the um, uh, see this. Everybody should read here. Anybody read this? You need to read this. You want to be discuss the Constitution, really what it means? Read this. All right, here's the Constitution, right? So uh, the Tenth Amendment. Um, says this. The Federalist Papers were written by James Madison, wrote 20, there's 85 papers. 29 of them are Madison, 51 of them are Hamilton, and five of them are John Jay. John Jay got sick and so he only could write five. And what was John Jay, what was his office when the country first started? Secretary of State? No, he wasn't Secretary of State, that's Jefferson. <laughs> Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Chief Justice. You should see what he said. You should read his writings. We're way off. Here's the Tenth Amendment. The power's not delegated. This Constitution is not... The power's not in the federal government. It's in the states. This is a state document. This isn't a federal document. The Bill of Rights was written to, so that the federal government wouldn't injure you. Tenth Amendment says the power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states. In other words, if it's not enumerated exactly in the Constitution, and the states are not prohibited from doing it, then that means the document is reserved to the states, respectively, or to the people. That's where the people get their uh, power the states. And we've kind of, we don't do that anymore. We've kind of seeded that. We need some governors to stand up now and start speaking out. That's not right. But what do you mean it's not right? Well, it says over here in the, doc, well that document's outdated. That document doesn't work anymore. I was in a class recently teaching a class and I asked the class, there must have been 35 people in the class, and I said, uh, and there were people from all different stripes. I said, how many people in here, do you, how many of you in this class think that the, uh, we'll get the next slide too, think that the Constitution is now outmoded, it's outdated? Every one of them thought that. I said, well, then it's a 35 to one vote because I'm teaching this class and I don't think that. <laughs> 35 people thought that. All different stripes, all different parties. All different feelings. It doesn't work anymore. Go to the next one. Yeah, I want this. This is very important. All right, now, I told you before that we shouldn't have won this war. Does your computer work? It's coming up. We shouldn't have won this war, and on this slide, you're going to see the disparities. All right, on the left-hand side is the American situation. That should come up sometime. And on the right is the British, in the red. We had about 2.5 million people, and 20% of those were slaves. 20% were slaves. Now, you may say to yourself, um, you know, the country was really unfair because we did have slavery. And uh, that was a blight on, on the uh, country. Okay, so I, I have a question for you then. You're at the Constitutional Convention. Would you have signed it? How many of you would not have signed it, the Constitution? <laughs> Don't be afraid. I'm not. Hey, I want you to disagree. <laughs> I don't, I'm not here for you to disagree with me. I want you to think about this. Is there anybody here that wouldn't have signed the Constitution? Well then, okay, all of you would have signed it, so then you voted for slavery. Yep. Right? Yep. No. Is that right or not? Yes. 
All right. Because, what's that? You would have tolerated it. All right, you would have tolerated it. The fact of the matter is, and this is what you got when you go on Oprah Winfrey, and she questions you about this, like she did to Senator McCain, and he didn't have an answer. When she starts questioning, oh, this, this is a, yeah, okay. Founding fathers were against slavery. Now you're going to say, oh, no, they weren't. Look at what happened. No, they were against it. And one of the founders at the federal convention had 300 slaves. He got up, he's from Virginia, and he got up and said, if we don't abolish this at this convention, the God of heaven will count us accountable. And his name was? Who? No, Washington didn't speak much. Jefferson wasn't at the convention. He wasn't at the Constitution. He was in France. That's okay, now you know that. Who was it? Who was the Virginian? Great man. He was a Pennsylvanian. Who was this Virginian? Got up, he had 300 slaves. Brilliant man. He wrote the Virginia the Declaration of Rights. George Mason. That's right. George Mason is who it was. And he got up and said this. Oh my goodness, and he's looking at South Carolina. He's looking at John Rutledge. John Rutledge is about six foot two. He had a great presence to him. He's, he was the second chief justice of the Supreme Court, you know. He was a governor of South Carolina. And um, nine of the states, how many states were at the federal convention? We'll talk more about this next week. I, mean, I can't go into detail today because we're talking about Washington, but next week we'll talk more about this. How many states were at the federal convention? Twelve, because Rhode Island didn't come, and they wound up calling them Rogue Island, <laughs> and we started to send ambassadors to them like they were a foreign country. They were so recalcitrant. I don't even, I don't count Rhode Island. Anyway, um, nine of the twelve states wanted slavery abolished. How do you like that? Did you know that? There was only three states that wanted it, and they were... Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina. And uh, Rutledge got up, he was from South Carolina, he kind of led the band, and he said, um, we know that slavery is wrong. Now you gotta read Madison's notes. Do I have them with me today? No, I don't have them with me. He says, we know that slavery is wrong, but we're gonna do it anyway because it's in our self-interest. And our constituents wouldn't, wouldn't go for it if we don't vote for it. Now, you're James Madison and you're writing these notes, okay? Uh, you're, you're listening to this. <clears throat> Madison wanted to get rid of his slaves too. You're listening to this and you're thinking, oh, this is, this is going to tear up this convention. Now, if you s stay in clay, <coughs> excuse me, and you don't compromise on this issue. There's a couple of other issues that had to be compromised. The rest of it was consensus. There was only three issues that were compromised. In the books, in your history books, you'll read the whole thing was a compromise. It's, it's not true, it's a lie. Most of it was consensus. It took 60 ballots to get a president. That's not a compromise. That's a consensus. If you do not compromise on this issue, the southern states walk and you have no union. So the question is, do you, are you going to have a union or you're not going to have one? So they made a clause in 1808, uh, we're going to stop the importation of slaves. And who signed that in 1807? What president signed that into law? <coughs> Excuse me. Which president? Thomas Jefferson, who is, uh, nowadays, we have, we're trying to destroy Jefferson. We're in, the, we're in the midst of destroying Jefferson. Now, if you destroy Jefferson, I just, I want you young people to understand this. This is very important. In between popcorn and movies, you gotta understand this. If you destroy Thomas Jefferson, 
you destroy the foundation of America. So don't let historians do that, because uh, that's a dangerous thing to be doing. Well, anyway, I just wanted to give you a little, little idea about that, because <clears throat> the odds of us winning the Revolutionary War, the British had 8 million, we had 2.5, and 20% were slaves. We had no navy to speak of. They had the largest navy in the world. They were the mother country. Humongous navy for those days. They controlled the seas. We really had no army. I told you about the army. When Washington went up to Massachusetts, he couldn't believe what he saw. They were totally untrained. They didn't, they weren't professionals or anything. They, he, was, he was up in arms with what he saw. He had a big job ahead. Not only did uh, the British have a standing army, we need the next, next slide. Mercenaries too, like the Hessians. Well, this is a very important slide. At the time of the revolution, <clears throat> the pulpits of America were on fire. You had men like George Whitfield and uh, Barclay, uh, who were just on fire at the pulpits at this revolution and what America stood for. They thought that America was the new Zion. And they were preaching that from the pulpit. The colonists thought that God was on their side. How do you like that? They're fighting for liberty. The war had an ideology to it. Not just a European dynastic squabble. We've got to stay away from European squabbles. We, we, after World War II, we've made many mistakes. We need to now go back. Let's take the next slide. We need to now, now go back and retrace what we've done. We've made many, many mistakes. We've become this international uh, place that uh, we, we've gotten involved in so many things that we don't even know what we're getting involved in. And it all started after World War I, which we should not have gotten into. That's true. Now, the British had some serious problems. They thought the militia, our militia, was weak. They never made a distinction between the militia and wartime units. They believed the rebels were a very small minority, and the British counted on a large loyalist backing, but only had around 20%. They thought that a lot of Americans would, would go for the British, but it didn't work out that way. Next. Yeah, yeah. Didn't most well, th this is a good point. You had a third of the colonists about were for uh, were sitting on the fence. You had about a third that were for the Americans. You had a whole group that were for the British. Then you had a whole group that were kind of in the middle. It doesn't take a lot to change a country. It doesn't take that big of a percentage. You can have 20% about, and you can do it. Um, this talks about some more of the problems. Uh, the divided centralized colonies, no strategic heart, major logistic and manpower problems, three miles across the Atlantic, at the Battle of Saratoga, uh, which was gentleman, General Burgoyne. Uh, he brought all, he had his mistress there, and then he brought all of these other troops, and they were, they were trucking through New York and all of these forests and everything, and the mosquitoes, and oh, it was terrible. And he didn't realize, and, and they had to have all their food and bedding and everything else, and the Americans just uh, took advantage of all that. And who was responsible for beating the British at Saratoga? Which general? They have a boot of him at Saratoga to this day. Benedict Arnold! Benedict Arnold is, is responsible. Let's get the next one. Okay, this is more about the British. 
They used slaves and they mobilized the Indian tribes. They had to have, be, be careful about the Indian situation and how you handle it. That's a very complicated situation. It is not a soundbite. It is not one against the other. It's very complicated. Believe me. It is a lot to the whole Indian situation. And uh, I wouldn't sit, tell you that you can, you can solve and you can know what happened in 10 minutes. It's very complicated. Go to the next part. All right, all of a sudden, this great man comes out of nowhere. In the midst of chaos, complete chaos. Here he comes. How old was Washington about at this time? This is 1776. How old is he there? 1775, I would say. 1775, he's 43 years old. He's born in 1732, right? So he's 43 years old. Go to the next one. All right, we got Fort Ticonderoga. This is very important. All right, I want the next slide of this. If you can get that. That's the one I want. That's the one we want. This is Ethan Allen. He knocks on that Fort Ticonderoga. You got all those, all those cannons over there, right? He knocks on there and he says, now the British uh, commander is Captain William Delaplace, right? He wouldn't open the door. The Americans thought they could take this fort. He doesn't open the door. Ethan Allen reportedly said this, Come out, you old rat. In the name of Jehovah and the Continental Congress. How do you like that? And they took Ticonderoga. They had all of these uh, cannons. And they wanted to put the cannons on top of Dorchester Heights, which was hundreds of miles away. And guess, guess what? They took those cannons in the snow. And there was a guy... And this is a true story, that um, carried one of those cannons on his back in the snow. He weighed 300 pounds. He was a printer. He was actually a bookstore. He wasn't even a printer. He, was a, he, he had a little bookstore, and he became a general. And his name was, he carried this cannon like hundreds of miles on his back in the snow. Yeah, that's a true story. What was this man's name? He was the first United States Secretary of War. Who is he? Now see, if you don't know this, then your children don't know it, and then nobody knows it. <laughs> that's Henry Knox. That's Henry Knox. He carried this cannon on his back. It's unbelievable. These stories, I don't even believe in myself, and I know I've, I've gone over these stories I don't know how many times. These are unbelievable stories. But this I love. You got Ethan Allen there. Come out, you old rat, in the name of Jehovah and the Continental Congress. Get out here. And he gets them out there, and they take Tycon Rover. They take all the cannons, and they bring them. Go to Dorchester Heights. They point them down at the British. The British leave. Not, no, no firing. Nobody was killed. They leave. But then they came back, and that was when the trouble started. Go on to the next one. No, I don't want that. Next. A great doctor died. at the. He was a martyr at the Battle of Bunker Hill that really enlivened the Continental Congress to get into this war. His name was Dr. Uh, Warren, and um, his wife, uh, Mercy Otis Warren, I believe, was really one of the great women, patriots. You hear about Abigail Adams a lot, but this Mercy Warren was really a great patriot. So uh, I went too far. That's okay. Go, go, go ahead. She never yeah. liberated go, a lot keep of going. prisoners from the ships. The warships. They did what? Didn't she liberate some of the prisoners from the ships? Did they liberate she, some of the prisoners? Yes. From the the British, you mean? Yes. That she liberated them. Yes, prisoners she, prisoners did. she did. She did. That's right. That's, a, that's exactly right. All right, now let me tell you about Quebec. The, the Americans were this close to having Canada. We almost had Canada. And um, <clears throat> a great man named Benedict Arnold went up with General Montgomery. They went through the ice water, the mud. They went from like New Hampshire, Vermont area, all the way up to Quebec, and they walked in all the elements. 
and their job was to take Quebec and they would take Canada. <clears throat> they got there and they didn't win that one. They didn't win, and, and as a matter of fact, Benedict Arnold was shot in the leg and he, he was injured. Others were killed and he had to recover from that. Unfortunately, his wife convinced him to uh, take the cause of the Tories and he, he betrayed the country. That was his second wife. Yeah, his second wife, yeah. The first wife was my relative. Yeah, the second wife, that's right. I didn't want to get into that detail. <laughs> uh, it was unfortunate because uh, Benedict Arnold was a great general. But he, uh, he did betray, he almost betrayed the whole revolution at West Point. All right, go to the next slide. Okay, we, I talked a little bit about that already. Go to the next one. No, go again. More. More. Okay, that's Washington crossing the Delaware. Go through all those pictures. Keep going. More. No, we talked about Trent. Keep, keep going. <laughs> no, keep going. Talk about Princeton. No. <clears throat> no. No, keep going. Keep going. There's a lot of battles in here, but I want to tell you some major things that happened along the way. Keep going. All right, Saratoga, I told you about. There's Burgoyne. Benedict Arnold. All right, Burgoyne surrenders. Go ahead. Now, stop right there. All right, now, the Americans need help. Who's over in France to help the American cause? Well, Lafayette came here. He was a good friend of Ben Franklin. Now, Ben Franklin wound up bankrupting France. And because of the money he got from France, as they entered the war, later on, Louis XVI was beheaded. That's because Ben Franklin took the money from their treasury for the American cause. <coughs> and uh, <clears throat> Ben Franklin was so popular, there's a great man right there. He was so popular that if you went to the commode in France, his picture was on the bottom of it. <laughs> his pictures were on the walls. They were on statues. They're everywhere. Ben Franklin, they just loved Ben Franklin. Now Franklin and Adams didn't get along. They didn't get along at all. As a matter of fact, they, uh, one time Adams came over and they had to sleep in the same room. And uh, Franklin liked the window open, so he opened the window at night. He went back to bed. Adams closed the window. And Franklin got back up and he opened it. He went back to bed and Adams closed the window again. And oh, I'm telling you, they just did not get along at all. And Adams really was, Adams was a great man, but he wasn't the diplomat that Franklin was. You have to be diplomatic too. You may have a point of view that's correct, but if you can't communicate that point of view, it uh, may not do you much good. You gotta be able to Well, <clears throat> the French entered the war. Hey, go ahead, go further. They sent, then, then Steuben came. Up further, further. There's Molly Pitcher who helped out. Another woman patriot. No nope, more. <clears throat> I want to get down to Yorktown. Calpins was very important, but I want, I, okay. Let's get down to Yorktown. <clears throat> All right now, how many of you have been to Yorktown? Quite a few. All of a sudden, it was 1781 now. The, the, the Americans were almost, they didn't have any money. How many uh, battles did Washington actually win in the Revolutionary War? There are many battles. And one thing Washington was very good at was retreating. <laughs> Stay away from the, from the British because he was outmanned. He was outgunned. So how many battles did he actually win? 
Yeah. Three. Two, one, none. One, two, two, three. He won Princeton, Trenton, and Yorktown. And guess what? He didn't want to go to Yorktown. He wanted to win in New York. He was still mad at the British for New York when they took it. And there was a general from the French, uh, <clears throat> the French army named Rochambeau who sat down with Washington and convinced him, look, we'll take troops down here, we'll add to the American troops, we've got Cornwallis's corner down there at Yorktown, and we've got De Grasse down at the West Indies, and he'll catch those, those winds, and he'll, be, he'll float up and we'll pincer uh, Cornwallis in because those trade winds, but you gotta hit those trade winds just right in those particular two weeks. So sure enough, they went down to, to Yorktown, they had about 15,000 troops. And here's de Grasse coming up and they meet the British in the Chesapeake, I guess. They meet them, they have this fight and the French take them, French take them. So they pincer them in there and Cornwallis, the arrogant one, wants to get out. Just like Washington got out of New York, Cornwallis says, we got to get out of here or we're ducks too. So he gets his troops, he starts to float them out, and guess what happened? Lo and behold, another natural occurrence comes up. And what was it? You had hurricane type winds, and the French, and excuse me, the British ships get blown back to shore, and they can't get out. And Cornwallis in his diary, says, even God is on the side of Washington. My goodness, they couldn't get out. And the Americans took them. Washington was one who would go into the breach. And they took them at Yorktown. And um, they went to exchange swords. And, and Cornwallis wouldn't come out. He wouldn't come out. And so he sent a second. They give the sword to Washington. Washington says, wouldn't take the sword. He said, here's Benjamin Lincoln. He's my second. Give him the sword. Well, that really, that was the battle that really closed the war. But then you had two more years from 1781 to 1783. What was going on there? Well, we almost lost the whole thing. How come? What happened? Well, <clears throat> oh, and I want to tell you one little story of Thomas Nelson. Thomas Nelson signed the Declaration of Independence. He had a mansion in Yorktown. And George Washington came up to him during the Battle of Yorktown. And he said, your mansion is right in the middle of the big brick mansion. It's right in the middle of the battlefield. Is there anything we can do? And, and uh, Thomas Nelson said, yes, destroy my whole house completely, level it. That's what they did. That's right, for independence. He died a pauper, Nelson. He signed the Declaration of Independence. Well, during the um, spring of 1783, the Americans were ready to mutiny. They were so mad at the Continental Congress they, they weren't getting any money for their services. They're ready to mutiny and uh, they're writing letters and <clears throat> uh, Nicola, Colonel Nicola is writing this letter to all the officers to meet at Newburgh, New York. Meet in Newburgh, New York and we're going to mutiny, we're going to take over ourselves. Now this is the normal occurrence that occurs when countries, when it goes back and forth like this. They don't sit down for four months and discuss it out. That's what we need to do now, by the way. That's one of the things we need to do as a country. We need to sit, get all the wise people, men and women, uh, the wisest of the wise, sit them around the table for four months and say we've got some problems here. 
How can we solve these problems? That's got to be done. Well, Nicola got all these officers together and Washington got wind of it. And um, not only that, Washington received a letter that they wanted him to be king. And what did Washington say about that? Not only no, but he was outraged at the thought. Now most would take that. This is, this, we don't have any record of history of this. This, this is, this is not a, a, an occurrence that happens. There's no record of this kind of activity, of this kind of behavior. So he was outraged. And uh, he showed up at this meeting at Newburgh. And he got up to speak to the men. And the men were outraged. They wanted a mutiny. With or without Washington, they were going to mutiny. The military. So the officers are there at Newburgh. The room is packed. And Washington has talked to them and he's telling them how the Continental Congress is pretty good and how things are going to work out. And they're getting madder by the moment. And uh, Washington sees they're kind of upset, and all of a sudden, uh, and it happened um, spontaneously. He says, okay, man, I, I have something to read to you. And he takes out this letter from his pocket. And uh, he takes out of the other pocket his Benjamin Franklin spectacles. He puts them on, and, and the men hadn't seen it. The spectacles, only the closest aides to Washington knew that he wore these glasses, these spectacles. <coughs> then he took the spectacles, he's, read, he's reading this, and he's stumbling, and he takes the spectacles off, and he says, uh, and this is all spontaneous. He says, uh, men, I've grown gray in your service. Now I think I'm going blind. Oh, I, I, I'm telling you. There wasn't a dry eye in the house. And Washington took the letter, he put it back in his pocket, and all of a sudden the men remembered what he had done at Valley Forge, what he'd done at Trenton, at Monmouth, at Princeton, at Brandywine, at Yorktown. He walked out, he took that charger, and he, he rode off, the men went to the window and they're, they're just in tears. They said, if it's good enough for him, we'll try it a little further. And he saved the revolution. And Thomas Jefferson says this in a letter that he wrote to Washington. The moderation and virtue of a single character have probably prevented this revolution from being closed as most others have been by a subversion of that liberty it was intended to establish. So the revolution wasn't closed and Washington saved it again. Well, the war finally ended and the British forts were still here but the British finally sailed off and then in December of uh, 1783, <clears throat> Washington met some of his officers at Francois Tavern in New York. And um, that scene I'll just have to tell you about it. That scene was a scene like none other because Washington, oh, let me, let me get it from here. Washington um, gave a little speech to his officers to bid them farewell. He had to go to Annapolis and John Marshall was there
Who's he? Who's John Marshall? John Marshall fought in the Revolutionary War. Who was John Marshall? Supreme Court Justice. Yeah, he's the fourth Supreme United States Supreme Court Justice, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And he ruled on a, on a very important case called Marbury versus Madison. Have you ever read that? About 21 pages in the case. You need to read that because it's a very bad case. It's really hurt the country, that particular case. But John Marshall was a great man. And he was there at Francois Tavern. And he records this. The day finally came when Washington's work was finished. And he could be, as he phrased it, translated into a private citizen. John Marshall describes the scene as follows. At noon, the principal officers of the army, officers of the army, assembled at Francois Tavern, soon after which their beloved commander entered the room. His emotions were too strong to be concealed. Now, a lot of people uh, think that Washington was this stiff. He was quite emotional, actually. Filling a glass, he turned to them and said, with a heart full of love and gratitude, I'll take leave of you. I most devoutly wish that your latter days may be as prosperous and happy as your former ones have been glorious and honorable. Having drunk, he added, I cannot come to each of you to take my leave, but shall be obliged to you if each of you will come and take me by the hand. General Knox, being nearest, turned to him incapable of utterance. Washington grasped his hand and embraced him. In the same affectionate manner, he took leave of each succeeding officer. In every eye was the tear of dignified sensibility, and not a word was articulated to interrupt the majestic silence and the tenderness of the scene. Well, when that scene was over, because they'd been through a lot, and they knew what they were fighting for, and they had won a war that was so miraculous and incomprehensible, and they knew it, that it was hard to put in words what those eight years entailed. Well, Washington then went to Annapolis, and they wanted Washington to be king. But there's an old prophecy that says that this country will have no king. And sure enough, Washington went to Annapolis and he went to a full packed gallery at Annapolis. But instead of using his sword to take the government, he unsheathed his sword and he handed it to the President of the Continental Congress, who was General Thomas Mifflin. And the crowd was in stunned silence that such a man even lived. He walked out the door. He got on that white charger. And he rode down to Mount Vernon. And on Christmas Eve, he got to Mount Vernon. And guess who was waiting at the door? Martha. That happened. Well, every year, now you might say, well, what makes a man like this? Now, here's the book that all of you young people should read. I know you don't have time to read all these pages. You've got a lot of homework and uh, Sometimes history gets in the way. But I suggest this book because this book tells of the spirituality of our first president. And he uh, read, he was taught a group of rules called the Rules of Civility. And I want to read you some of this. There's about 108 of them. How to conduct yourself. Now, if maybe if the 
in Baltimore, if they had read the rules of civility, <laughs> look, the only difference between um, burning the flag and saluting the flag is what? We went over this last week. It's what? Well, choices, but, but what do you make those choices? Beliefs. That's the only difference. The, per the person who burns the flag, there's something in his belief system that says this isn't any good. But when you salute the flag, you respect it, and there's something in your belief system that says we need to respect this. Well, Washington grew up with these rules of civility, and he'd read this, and I'm going to read you a few of them. This is the 88th one. I'll read you 88, 89, and 90, and then I'm going to read you a few more. Be not tedious in discourse. Make not many digressions, nor repeat often the same manner of discourse. In other words, shut up. <laughs> now, we had a president once that we don't talk about anymore. We've completely forgotten him. And he was the only president in the 20th century who cut taxes four times and cut the budget twice, simultaneously. And his name was? Who? I can't hear. Who? Reagan. No, Reagan never cut the budget. Coolidge. Who? Calvin Coolidge. Calvin Coolidge. And one time, um, a woman sat next to him during a meal, uh, a, a general banquet, and she said, uh, I have a bet uh, that you will say three words to me or more. And he looked at her and said, you lose. Um, he didn't say much, but when he said things, he did it the right way. We completely forgot about him. We need to go back. We need to look at that. He spent a lot of time with his budget secretary. He spent a lot of time with his treasury secretary. They went carefully over the budget and said, the budget's too big, it's $7 billion. It's too big. We've got to cut it. The 89th uh, rule of civility, speak not evil of the absent, for it is unjust. That's true. 90th, being said at meat, scratch not, neither spit, cough, or blow your nose, except there's a necessity for it. <laughs> so you young people don't blow your nose when you're, when you're eating. Now here's the 108th, 109th, and 110th. These are the last three. When you speak of God or his attributes, let it be seriously and with reverence. Honor, obey, honor and obey your natural parents, although they be poor. It doesn't matter if your parents are poor or rich. That has no, no bearing on it. Honor thy mother and thy father, that thy days upon the land may be long which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Yeah. Here's the 109th. That your recreations be manful, not sinful. And uh, Washington was very careful. He, at, when he was in his 20s, he all of a sudden recognized that he had a place. He had a, but there was something he had to do. And he was very careful in his conduct. 110th is the last one. Labor to keep alive in your breast that little spark of celestial fire called conscience. And you do that by attuning yourself to the laws of nature and nature's God. And then you keep your conscience good so that conscience can, can kind of talk to you and, and, and give you ideas and let you do things in the right way. Well, um, Washington gave a farewell address, which is read in Congress every year to an empty house. And in that farewell address, he gave um, very important advice to his countrymen. We don't take that advice anymore. We kind of have uh, said that was for the 18th century, it's not for now. 
But here's one of the things he did say. Of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion, this is in the farewell address, religion and morality are indispensable supports. In vain would that man claim the tribute of patriotism who should labor to subvert these great pillars of human happiness. The mere politician, equally with the pious man, ought to respect and cherish them. A volume could not trace all their connections with private and public felicity. And let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. How do you like that? Reason and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principle. Now last week we talked about John Locke and I asked you last week, and I'm going to ask you again today, did you talk to your brain this morning? Did you talk to your brain? You did talk to your brain? Was it a good conversation? Good. Did it talk back? It did what? Okay. Well, John Locke said, every morning you should talk to your brain and figure out the existence of man. What, what are you here for? Well, what's this all about anyway? And he was the one who said, after he talked to his brain, and he said, there's a rock over here, and that, that's a, a non-cogitative element. doesn't think. I'm a cogitative being. That rock couldn't have created me. So that means... Something with, that was cogitative created me, a cogitative being. He went through all this. And then he said that um, atheism is irrational. He says, you know how I know it is? I talked to my brain this morning. And it, it didn't make any sense. It wasn't reasonable. So it was irrational. Well, that's the way the Founding Fathers were thinking. And... Um, let me just read one more thing from Washington, from his farewell address. You've probably forgotten this little part, but I'm going to read it to you so you to remind you of it. Because uh, many are saying today that we need to, uh, the Constitution is now elastic, very elastic, and it doesn't work anymore. And we, we have the media saying that, we have a lot of people saying it. It's not, it's outmoded. Well, here's the way Washington was thinking about that. I think Washington knew better than we did. I cannot omit the occasion to congratulate you and my country on the success of the experiment. This was a grand experiment. Nobody had ever tried it before. Nor to repeat my fervent supplications to the supreme ruler of the universe and sovereign arbiter of nations that his providential care may still be extended to the United States, that the virtue and happiness of the people may be preserved, and that the government, now listen to what he said, the government which they have instituted, he was part of it, but he was self-effacing, he said they, they have instituted for the protection of their lives may be perpetual. You see, they believed, and Madison repeats it and the other founding fathers, they believed that the way to change with society and the culture is amend. You amend the Constitution. Now we have an issue before the uh, country now, a gay marriage issue. Now, what, what, whatever you feel about gay marriage, I want to discuss the issue itself being decided by the Supreme Court. It is folly for one person in the country, if it's a 5-4 vote, you got one person, and it might be Justice Kennedy. According to the Wall Street Journal, they think it will be Justice Kennedy. One person is going to decide for an entire country on a social issue. We need to look 
at our form of government and say, that doesn't belong in the Supreme Court. Where does that belong? It belongs in the states. The people vote for that. If the people want to change the culture, that's a, they want to do that in California. They want to, if they want a, a marriage in California of a man and woman, they vote for that. And they did vote for it, and it was overturned by a judge. But the but the governor of the of the state should have said, "I'm not going to execute that," because we're not going to overturn the people by an opinion of one person. He didn't do that. Uh, we we need to take a, a rethink what we're doing. Because it's very destructive. Washington said this needs to be perpetual. These institutions need to be perpetual. And then I want to read you a couple of what things that he said. And then I'm going to close it. If I can get through this. With his funeral. Um... I want to read you a few things that Washington said that we need to take heed of. He spoke about separation of powers and he said this, it is important that the habits of thinking in a free country should inspire caution in those entrusted with its administration to confine themselves within their respective constitutional spheres, avoiding in the exercise of powers of one department to encroach upon another. The spirit of encroachment tends to consolidate the powers of all the departments in one, and thus to create whatever the form of government, a real despotism. He said that a long time ago. I'm going to read you what he said about love and marriage. You interested in that? Let me read you this. He had some very wise counsel. Oh, first let me read you what he said about liberty. He said this in 1791. We do not wish to be the only people who may taste the sweets of an equal and good government. We look with an anxious eye to the time when happiness and tranquility shall prevail in your country. He's writing to the Marquis de Lafayette. He says, in France, we'd like the same thing. And when all Europe shall be freed from commotions, tumults, and alarms. That hasn't happened. Now, here's Washington's advice on love. Do not, in your contemplation of the marriage, the marriage state, look for perfect felicity before you consent to wed. <laughs> <laughs> Nor conceive from the fine tales the poets and lovers of old have told us of the transports of mutual love that heaven has taken its abode on earth. Nor deceive yourself in supposing that the only means by which these are to be obtained is to drink deep of the cup and revel in an ocean of love. Love is a mighty pretty thing, but like all other delicious things, it is cloying. And when the first transports of the passion begin to subside, which they assuredly will do, and yield oft times too late to more sober reflections, it serves to evince that love is too dainty a food to live upon alone and ought not to be considered farther than is a necessity ingredient for that matrimonial happiness which results from a combination of causes, none of which are of greater importance than that the object on whom it is placed should possess good sense, good disposition, and the means of supporting you in the way you've been brought up. Pretty good. Pretty good counsel. All right, now. Uh, I want to read to you a 
Washington um, at the end of his life he went out one, one morning and he was in 1799 December 1799 and it was very cold that morning, and he went out five hours to look at his plantation in Mount Vernon. Now here's a man, he was 67 years old, we're going into the 19th century in a, in a, in a month. He never had an injury during the Revolutionary War, he never had a shot, he never suffered a, a wound. During the whole war, he went out one morning, he rode around his acreage, started to snow, he was five hours out there and he came home, he uh, read the newspaper, he was a Federalist, and uh, that's courage by the way when you have to start another party in opposition to Washington, that's what Jefferson did. He read the paper and then all of a sudden, he felt a little funny and he said, I, I need to go to bed. He went to bed, woke up in the middle of the night and he could hardly speak. He got the doctors in there. Dr. Craig came and a couple of other doctors, Dr. Brown. And they checked him and they, they thought, well, we're not sure what he's got, but we're going to bleed him. And they bled him. And they kept bleeding him. That's what they did in those days. And, and nothing worked. And, and finally he said, that's enough. And he laid and he passed away. There's a man that was never, never suffered a wound during the Revolutionary War. Passed away with five hours on his plantation. You can't tell me that he wasn't looked after. Because I don't believe it. Well, at his funeral, John Adams became the president. He was the president then, by then. He said, his example now complete. It will teach wisdom and virtue to magistrates, citizens, and men, not only in the present age, but in future generations, as long as our history shall be read. But we're not reading about Washington anymore. We've completely forgotten. We may know a few events, but when you add up the whole thing from start to finish, you say, this is a special, there's something special about this country. Well then, Light Horse Harry Lee got up, General Lee, and gave a eulogy. And who was Light Horse Harry Lee's son? Robert E. Lee. Robert E. Lee. So Light Horse Harry Lee got up and said this, Will you go with me to the banks of the Monongahela to see your youthful Washington supporting in the dismal hour of Indian victory the ill-fated Braddock and saving by his judgment and his valor the remains of a defeated army pressed by the conquering savage foe? Or, when oppressed, America nobly resolving to risk her all in defense of her violated rights he was elevated by the unanimous voice of Congress to the command of her armies. Who is there that has forgotten the vales of Brandywine, the fields of Germantown, the plains of Monmouth, everywhere present, once of every kind, obstructing numerous and valiant armies encountering, himself a host. He assuaged our sufferings, limited our privations, and upheld our tottering republic. Possessing a clear and penetrating mind, a strong and sound judgment, calmness and temper for deliberation. With invincible firmness and perseverance and resolution, maturely formed, drawing information from all, acting for himself, with incorruptible integrity. Yes, integrity, that's what we look for. 
We don't look for intelligence. That's nice if you got that. We look for integrity. That's what we look for for leadership. Incorruptible integrity and unvarying patriotism. His own superiority and the public confidence alike marked him as the man designed by heaven to lead in the great political as well as military events which have distinguished the era of his life. First in war, first in peace, and first in the hearts of its countrymen. We'll see you next week. Thank you.